one, and we are in the final week of our Origins class, Genesis 1. And so my goal today is to end early for a couple reasons. Number one, we want to make sure that I give enough time for questions and answers if anybody has any. Um, if it's too difficult, I'm not going to answer it, which all of them will be too difficult, so I just won't answer any questions. Um, and then uh, I've gone over on time the last two Sundays. Um, and the first Sunday, um, we started 15 minutes late. I actually was on time. But the last two Sundays, I went real late on time, and I want to be able to compensate for that. So I'm going to go a little quick today. So if you're taking notes, I know some of you are, if you're taking notes, I would suggest shorthanding um, as much as you can or writing fast, um, but we will cover the final two compromising theories today. Uh, again, as a review, this is Origins. We studied the biblical creation account and we compared it to the naturalistic evolution account and now we are finishing the compromising theories of Origins in recent and modern history. Again, uh, as a bit of a review, why should we study Origins? We're not going to take too much time in talking about this slide because we've seen it all four weeks. Um, the education system's teaching our youth the absolutely wrong thing about how you and I came about. Also, studying the origins account or the creation account can actually help a person understand other parts of Scripture as well. And then as the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 3.15, we ought to be ready to give a defense or to give an answer for what we believe in. We talked about the four pillars of everything. We've seen this the last four weeks as well. In order for you to have an idea of what is being created, or in order for you to have a theory, you have to have a creator. That's the first thing that you have. What is it that created? Who is it that created? Also, you need to have the process. How was the process uh, come about? How much time did it take? And again, in order for you to accept any of these theories, you have to be able to take it through faith. And you have to be able to believe it through faith. So last week, we took a look at the first compromising theory, and that's theistic evolution. We looked at theistic evolution, and we talked about some of the things that theistic evolution taught. Uh, every, ev excuse me, every evolutionary and naturalistic process that has been discovered to be true is actually a proven fact. Uh, so everything about evolution is true, and it's proven by science, if this is what you believe in theistic evolution. Um, singularity, that's that small dot about the size of a period on a sheet of paper, the thing that exploded, created the Big Bang. Singularity could not have existed um, forever. It couldn't have existed perpetually. We have to have a creator to it. So the easiest thing or the most simple thing to do is to make God the creator of singularity. Um, alongside with that, we ask the question, does God have the ability to create the universe through naturalistic process? And we deciphered this question a bit. Um, we, answered, we answered the fact that this is kind of a dishonest question. Uh, if you were to say yes or no, I guess you could say yes, but the truth is, it really goes against the character of God because God didn't, have, uh, didn't create the world through naturalistic process. So we can't really try to decipher if he had the ability to or not. So rather, we have to ask, does God have, or did God create the universe through naturalistic processes? And then again, that you can answer more of a yes or no based on the Bible. If you say yes, then these are your assumptions. Evolutionary statements will always trump biblical statements. Um, whatever science says is fact, God's word has to adjust to science. Um, you can't necessarily say in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was not even created until billions of years after the Big Bang. That just doesn't make much sense. It doesn't coexist. So in order for that to happen, you have to reinterpret the Bible. You have to say, well, the Bible's a figment or a figurative speech. It's not true. You can't take it literally. And so um, if it contradicts evolutionary principles, then the Bible has to change. Again, we have that backwards. So if you think this through, if theistic evolution were true, then the Bible's 100% wrong about the order of which things were created. Again, the first thing we see created is the heavens and the earth. But in evolution, the first thing that's created is stars. Uh, or one of the first things I should say is created is stars. You actually have a bunch of gases and, 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 and heat and antimatter, I guess, would technically be the first thing that was created um, through evolution. But that doesn't coexist. If God is wrong about um, the beginning of the world, then he's wrong about the end of the world as well. Again, he would be wrong with the fact that... Uh, 
evolution and saying that we're just constantly getting better, we are improving, but eventually we're gonna die out of this heat wave, which really makes no sense because uh, nothing in the world is gonna be warm enough to actually sustain any type of life. It's gonna be really, really cold. And so in trillions of years, we're all gonna die out where God says, yeah, this world is not gonna exist anymore, but we're gonna create a new heaven and a new earth, and that's gonna last forever. forever. It's gonna last forever. There is not gonna be an end to that and um, there won't be no dying of a heat wave there. And then also, if the essay evolution were true, then you have to make six days figurative. So we took some time, we discussed the days, we looked at what the Genesis 1 definition of day was. Uh, the fact of the matter is day is from the Hebrew word yom. Yom literally means the 24 hour period. But the thing that made it interesting was every time you look at where the word day is in the Bible in Genesis 1, it's always uh, paired with the evening and the morning. This is literally an emphasis that it's a 24-hour period. You can literally read where the Bible says, and the evening and the morning with the third day, you can say, and this 24-hour period was the third 24-hour period. It's God literally saying, listen, make sure you get this. This is a literal 24. It's not an elongated billions and billions of years. Uh, this is what this means. And so anytime you see day or yom, which is used about 2,008 times, um, it's going to mean a 24-hour period. So today, we are going to blaze right on through, and we're going to talk about the next compromising theory, and this is the gap theory. Now, the gap theory is literally one of my favorite ones to study because it's, it literally involves a lot of imagination. Uh, they, there's people who say that there is biblical support for it, and you can actually really make a strong argument and a strong case uh, against the gap theory. But the fact of the matter is, uh, the gap theory literally requires a lot of overthinking, if you will, and a lot of imagination. Um, are a lot of you familiar with this gentleman here, C.I. Schofield? Uh, a lot of you have heard this uh, guy before. He's the one that really promotes the gap theory. Has anyone, does anyone own a Schofield Bible or ever have owned a Schofield Bible? Okay, Joel, Pastor, uh, Mr. Campert, I know he has one as well. Um, yeah, uh, we sell the Schofield Bible in Pensacola Christian College. Um, and so the Schofield Bible is is something that's a commonality, you know, you see the Schofield Bible, but if you look at the Schofield Bible, the, the gap theory is actually really supported by C.I. Schofield, and he was the catalyst uh, to this particular theory. And so we actually have a clip or a, a um, screenshot of what the Schofield Bible would look like, and if you have one, <clears throat> the, what's that now? Yeah, it would be Genesis 1. Um, I, I remember I looked at Randy Campert's and it looks exactly like this which is pretty much all of the Schofield Bible, uh, all the Schofield Bibles that I've seen. So, when you see Genesis 1, uh, I'll read the, I know it's kind of small print, so I'll just kind of read it. You have chapter 1, this is a screenshot from Genesis 1. You have chapter 1, and then right under it, you have the subtitle, The Original Creation. And so it goes on in verse 1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Then comes the gap. This is the gap of time that, um, C.I. Schofield introduced. The subtitle here says, Earth made waste and empty by judgment. And that is verse number two, where verse number two comes in, and the earth was out form of void, and darkness moved upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So, we see that, and if you study, we're not going to take time to read um, his excerpts here, but if you study um, the actual notes that C.I. Schofield has in the Schofield Bible, He's saying that in between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, there's a gap of time that has not been talked about, in the, or that is not being talked about in the Bible, uh, at least in this particular account. Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 are two completely separate creations. And so, let's get into that a little bit. What does the gap theory actually teach? Again, uh, the gap exists between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. So this is what essentially happens. In the beginning, God created 
the heaven and the earth. That world, that heaven, and that earth is completely different than the earth that you and I are accustomed to today. It's not even close. And so God made, according to the gap theorists, God made the world, and then something happened. By the way, in this world, there's what gap theorists will call pre-Adamic man. Pre meaning before, Adamic, another word for Adam. So man before Adam. You and I know Adam is the first man. But the, the gap theorists will say that there was actually a race of people before, um, before Adam. Mm -hmm. And so that's where Genesis 1 and Genesis, or Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2 come into play. It's not the same thing. So... So there's two creations, he's saying? He's saying that there is two creations. He's saying that the first one is the heavens and the earth that he created, and then somewhere in this gap, um, it, it actually gets a lot more interesting. Uh, uh, let me go on with the slides. The next thing is that this gap literally could have had a long duration. Um, we don't know how long this gap is because the Bible doesn't tell us. Well, my refute to that is the Bible doesn't tell us that there's a gap in the first place. But you have to completely destroy scripture in order to support this theory. So, what gap theorists are pretty much trying to do is say, okay, listen, here is a part of scripture that we can alter or reinterpret, if you will, so that way we can make the earth long, make the earth an old age, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years. Maybe not necessarily billions, because billions will get into the realm of evolution, but gap theorists cannot wrap their mind around the fact that the earth was created we, we assume to be about 6,000 years ago. So, you have to fit this into uh, this realm of logic that doesn't make any sense in order for you to get this long time. So, this gap could have literally been thousands, but most likely probably even millions of years old. Now, here's the bread and butter of it. And again, if you're taking notes, you don't have to write all of this down. During this gap, so-called prehistoric or pre-Adamic man existed. These are creatures that both lived and they died. Now that's important. Um, these creatures were not, if you will, eternal. These creatures, these creatures had the ability to die. These creatures, um, a lot of gap theorists would think that it was some sort of race of man as well. Um, they died. And during this gap, and during this gap world, if you will, Lucifer is the one who has reign over it. Lucifer is the one who is the reigning being over this gap world. In this gap world, something happens to Lucifer, he falls, and because he falls, God then destroys the original creation, the gap world, if you will. He destroys the original creation of what is called the Luciferian flood. Um, there was a flood, and it completely shattered and it completely destroyed that particular earth as we as gap theorists know it and so because god um, had created that first world completely destroyed it he said you know what i didn't do a good job in that first one this is literally what gap theorists would think i didn't do a good job in that first one i let lucifer run it that didn't go too well so i'm going to create another world and this world is going to be without form or void and, and the and darkness will move upon the face of the deep and the spirit of god will move upon the face of the waters then I'm going to create light, stars, uh, beasts of the air, beasts of the fowl of the air, beasts of the sea, man in my image, and we're going to do all of that in six literal days. So the rest of the creation account, according to the evolutionists, or excuse me, the, the gap theorists, is absolutely correct. But what you have to do is you have to, number one, you have to play with your imagination completely. You have to really just jump in and say, um, we have to try to fit millions and millions of years in. We have to try to be able to fit time into this particular thing. So let's put it somewhere where we can alter scripture. Now, this is where they'll alter the scripture. I have five pieces of scripture here that gap theorists often go to to support their theory. Now, if you have the time, I would really study all five, and you'll find that if you study them in context, it doesn't make sense. Uh, the gap theory just doesn't hold weight and it doesn't hold water. Now we're gonna, since we've been in Genesis the most time, we're gonna look at the two Genesis um, 
words here, or the two Genesis verses here. So Genesis 1, the first one is verse number 2. Let's begin reading of verse number 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The word was in Genesis 2 comes from the Greek word, or excuse me, it comes from the Hebrew word haya, which means to chop or perform karate. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, haya literally means. What's that? Hanya. <laughs> That's not what Strong says. I went to go listen to it. Hanya? Hanya. Okay. Then Strong's concordance is wrong, so I'm sorry. Um, but I'm going to go with the Strong's concordance. Haya, okay? Um, it comes from the Greek word, which literally means was or to be in existence. Um, the word became can also come from the, the Hebrew word haya. So they'll say instead of, and the earth was without form and void, they'll actually flip that word into its secondary meaning, which means became. <coughs> so they'll say, <coughs> excuse me. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth became without form and void. <clears throat> and the darkness moved upon the face of the deep, the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So they'll take that word and say, well, if it became without form or void, that means that it was something else. It had to have come from something else in order for it to become without form or void. And so this is where it makes sense to plug that gap. And by the way, if you translate it like that, it's a good idea that God made a world previous to uh, previous to the world that you and I are accustomed to. But this is what we were talking about last week. Whenever you open up the window, or whenever you open up the idea that something else could be true outside of Scripture, you always have false doctrine. Because what you're doing is you're opening up the idea for reinterpretation, and when you open up the idea for reinterpretation, you can take the scripture and get it to mean anything that you want. Um, when you say that God made the heaven and the earth, and the earth became without a form of void, you can literally say, yeah, there is an idea that there is this world that came beforehand, before the world that you and I know today. Now, everything else is literally up for human debate. You literally now put that theory into the hand of man rather than take God at his word. It could literally, if this is true, it could be millions of years. We don't know the Bible doesn't say. There could have been pre-Adamic man. We don't know the Bible doesn't say. Uh, there could have been man that have lived and died, or these could have been eternal beings. We don't know. God doesn't say. But what we do know is that God created a world before the world that you and I uh, know today because you have to take that word was and change it to the word became in order for the gap theory to be true. Um, let's look at Genesis 1. 28. And this is another way in which they'll destroy scripture. <clears throat> Genesis 1, verse number 28, the Bible says, And God blessed them, God gave, uh, said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every, li or, excuse me, every little living thing that moved upon the earth. Let's read that verse one more time, because I want you to see if you can find the word that gap theory, their gap theorists will try to switch up. Um, Genesis 1, verse number 28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Replenish? It would be the word replenish. The word replenish is something that the gap theorist needs to alter. Now, what they'll say is that that word replenish, based off of the English, means to fill again. Um, I'm out of water. I'm thirsty. I really need some water. Uh, it would be appropriate for me to say, Luke, uh, replenish my cup of water. Uh, to fill up that cup of water again. Um, and so, in order for there to, in order for, <clears throat> excuse me, there to be an again 
there has to be an original for you to replenish. But if you study that phrase, again, it just literally means to completely fill. Or excuse me, not, not again, replenish. If you study the word replenish, it literally means to completely fill. The word again, the idea again, is not found or supported in that word replenish. Now, again, if you take our translation, the, how Americans would use the word uh, replenish or even just uh, modern English today, you could take that translation and say, okay, well, the Bible says replenish, so that means it has to come again. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, when you study that word replenish, it literally means to fill. It literally means just to fill up. So again, the, cap, the gap theory, in order for that to be true, you just literally have to alter so many different parts of scripture. Again, uh, they have Isaiah 14, 12, uh, 21, that talks about uh, the desolation of Babylon and the fall of Lucifer. You have uh, Ezekiel 28 as well, that also talks about Lucifer in there as well. Um, take time and study these parts of scripture because what they literally have to do is they literally have to toy with the idea and get different parts of the Bible to mean uh, what the gap theory, yeah, to mean what they say, to mean what the gap theory is promoting. And so the idea that Schofield and others, um, random question, Dolan's family, have you guys ever had the Schofield Bible um, or owned the Schofield Bible? Okay. Uh, it's a common Bible. There's, again, uh, it's the King James Translation. It's regular translation. You know, the man's um, commentary is not inspired, use, but the word. It uses word. the Oxford edition, though, instead of the Cambridge edition. So it has some poor English. Uh, it has different words than a lot of other English King, King James Bibles do. That I did not know. Um, okay. That I, I didn't know. But... Um, I guess the, the point that I was actually going at was God's word is the one that's inspired, not man's commentary. Um, but then again, if, if it's going to take words out outside of what we would transcribe the Bible from, then it would be a dangerous thing to do, and it would be <laughs> literally taken out of Scripture, which we were warned against to do. So um, the next slide I have here is true biblical support. So again, if the gap theory is true... Um, you have to alter those words, and you just simply can't do that because you're, you're making God a liar, and you're taking God's word, and you're taking his translation, and taking what he says, and you're making it into what man says. So, the Hebrew word, haya, how do you say it? Anya? Haya. <laughs> okay. Haya. Haya. Uh, haya. The, Hebrew, the Hebrew word, uh, that H one there, in Genesis 1, verse 2, literally is translated as was. Um, you can't translate that to mean become or became uh, because that's not what it was intended. Uh, in fact, when you study just even the, the grammar of Genesis 1-1 all the way to verse number 3, verse number 2 is a parenthetical expression. So in other words, the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Oh, and by the way, to describe this heaven and earth that I'm talking about, it was without form and void, and darkness moved upon the face of deep, and spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Okay, just wanted to make sure we got that in. And now God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse number two serves as a parenthetical expression to describe verse number one and connect it to verse number three. If you study the grammar, it's all the same. It's all talking about the exact same type of creation. We're not saying God created the heaven and the earth Let's go ahead and put 30 million years here. And now the earth became without um, form and void. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and all of that jazz. Uh, you can't do that because it completely destroys the idea of taking God at his word. Also, Tony, if you can come in a little more quiet, please, that'd be great. Um, hey, Tony. <laughs> also... There is no support anywhere in the Bible for a Luciferian flood. You're not going to find a Lucifer's flood anywhere supported in the Bible whatsoever. You guys came in right after uh, and talked about that. Again, there would be the world is, when God says Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, yeah. um, it was the original creation. 
Oh, this I is never a heard it called Lucifer's Flood. I right. It's in the strong, I mean, the, the, the uh, Scofield Bible. Bible. But I got a question. Sure. Could it be possible that, when, let me ask this. Do you know when, um, okay, who, who did the, the translate? It, uh, Strong's Concordance. Uh huh. When did he do that? Maybe when they came up with this idea, Strong's Concordance wasn't written. Because a lot of these preachers originally, it was just God laid their hand upon them. They didn't always get to go to Bible school, but right. yet God worked through them. So, Strong's was, Concordance is my reference because I'm terrible at Hebrew. I don't know how to speak Hebrew at all. Um, for the people who translated from Hebrew and the Greek into English, the word was is the best translation that fits into that um, into no, that verse. No, that's the, the, point, the point that she's making, though, the actual opposite will be true. It's in the colleges and seminaries that the gap theory and the evolution was emphasized because they wanted to be scientific and accurate. So it was the educated people, actually, that introduced it. The uneducated people have no issue with God creating the heaven and the earth. You know, because they, they I think they, they uh, have more common sense about if God could create heaven and earth, then why does he need a gap? But C.I. Schofield was a scholar, and his, his uh, counterparts were scholars, and they were trying to reconcile scholarship and, and the Bible. Charlie had something on that, too. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, basically just to add to that, because at the time, whenever the theory was posited, it would have been, what, 18... Well, in 1800s, I believe. Okay. I, want to say, I keep thinking 1881. <laughs> For some reason, but that then again, that might have been also just whenever the West Counter Court was coming about too. But I don't think that's a correlation with that. There is a correlation but, with that, though. I mean, was the it? unbelief. Yeah, I mean that's that was the the whole you know attack on scripture and the evolution all happened simultaneously. Okay. And all those things. Uh, well, the I know with regard to the to the science <laughs> aspect of it is you had. Um, age of reason, basically, unbelieving scientists that are coming about from a non-biblical perspective saying, well, this is what we've been able to come to conclusion to, and this they're presenting it as fact, even though it's theory. Mm -hmm. And the a lot of the scholars are like, well, that seems logical and it seems factual, but they're, they overlook the fact that, that obviously it's, it's a faith issue rather than uh, a logic fact issue. And Joy, there's no, go ahead. I was going to say, this is the first time I've ever heard anybody who's expounding this. Where, where is this being taught today, the gap theory? It's not <laughs> as promoted um, as Henry I would Morris say. Morris killed it, you know, back in the 50s pretty much. Right, right. It's, you know. it's something that isn't really, really being, what's being really more so taught in colleges and schools and universities and even straight up is straight up evolution or, or theistic. The, theistic evolution. Uh, in Christian colleges, you know, where, okay, everything of evolution is true, just God did it. Um, but the gap theory would have been something that was earlier <coughs> taught. Um, I started with the most common compromise theory, and I'm um, kind of pulling away from that point. So the next theory that we'll look at is something that really isn't too much of a theory anymore. Um, no, don't apologize. Is that is that any, anything else? Um, so again, just to finish my thought with the Luciferian flood, um, Lucifer falls. Um, Lucifer is the reigner uh, or the, the king or the ruler, if you will, of this original creation. Then he falls, and because he falls, God decides to judge this original creation with a Luciferian flood, or Lucifer's flood, if you will, and just destroy that original creation. Then he recreates um, a world that became without form and void and all of that. So you don't find that anywhere in the Bible, uh, according to the point that I have on the, on the screen here. You can't find that. Um, there's only one flood that's talked about, and that's in the Genesis account, uh, the Noah's, Noah's flood with Noah's Ark. Um, also, the, this, this, if you go from a deeper and a theological standpoint, there's a couple flaws that comes up with the gap theory. The first thing is, God would have had to create man to die before sin ever was introduced into the world. Um, this this pre-Adamic man was not an eternal being, a being, according to gap theorists, which means if it lived, it then 
died. Um, there was no eternality to it. And so God literally would have had to create an imperfect being or a being that dies. And you don't see death in anywhere in scripture until sin is introduced. Remember, death means separation. So when sin entered in the world by Adam and Eve, they didn't physically die, but they were separated from God because God is eternally holy and man is finite and full of sin now and those two cannot connect. This is the importance of why we have a savior because Jesus Christ is that bridge of that gap that we just cannot get to by ourselves. If this is true, you have a whole race of man that has absolutely no chance of redemption because uh, all they do is just die for no reason because we don't know if they sinned or not or what have you. And so death would have had to occur before sin and thus God would have created something that was imperfect. Remember in the last verse of Genesis um, 1, God didn't say that things were good. He said that it was very, very good. It was his final stamp. It was his stamp of approval. And he created everything initially perfect. It wasn't his fault that we became imperfect. It was our own. It was man's fault. Man introduced sin into the world. So in order for this to be true, we have to have a pre-Adamic man who either sinned, thus deserved death, which would make God the creator of sin, which impugns the character of God, or we have a whole race of man that just died for no reason and lived for no reason. You can go deeper into that idea, but just that thought that death occurred before sin then takes Genesis 2 and Genesis 3 where man actually falls, it takes that to be figurative and it doesn't hold much weight and we really don't have that great of a need for a savior because we have a whole race that died without one, so whatever. So there would be gapers who would not have a pre-Adamic man. They would just have everything else in the world during that time period. But it still doesn't work because then you have the curse before the curse. Right, exactly. The effects of the curse, sin, uh, disease, uh, animals eating other animals, that sort of thing. Exactly. And so the, it, it, would, it would put things out of context and out of line. And um, God would have created something, again, that was just imperfect, which he can't do. You know, he is perfect. He created the world as we see it today. It initially was perfect. And again, sin entered into the world because of us, not because of um, God. And so uh, the gap theory just doesn't hold any weight. I thought you were going to say something. Sorry. Um, our final theory that we're going to look at is progressive creation. We're literally going to fly by this. Um, so much to the point that I don't have any other slides on the uh, progressive creationism outside of this one. And I'll just talk the, that theory through. That's also known as the day-age theory. And the reason why it's known as the day-age theory is because it's simply that. Each day that you see in Genesis 1 represents a certain age. Um, again, what you're doing is you're introducing time because you want to try to match science somehow. Um, we don't want to hold to the truth that the Earth most likely was created about 6,000 years ago. You have to add a couple other, 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 excuse me, other digits in there. Hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions. So what they'll say is each day represents a particular period of time. And when God said he created something on a certain day, it was just the peak of that initial creation. So everything started from infancy. So even, even if you start in verse number three where God says, let there be light, it didn't come out of nowhere. It actually took time. It was kind of like this dull thing, and then it just expanded through time into the light that you and I see today. When God created the fowl uh, of the air and the beasts of the sea, it wasn't birds flying and, and, and fish swimming. It was these little creatures that just kind of expanded over hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And again, what you're trying to do is you're trying to elongate time so that way it somewhat matches with evolution and again we can refute that by understanding that the Hebrew word yom for day yom literally means 24 hours um, there's no room for the day age theory this this theory just doesn't really hold too much weight because um, it, it doesn't really add to scripture and it literally just doesn't make too much sense uh, the name that comes to mind is Dr. Hugh Ross uh, he's the one that really has 
promoted this, if you will, and people are talking about it a little bit more today than probably about 30 or 40 years ago, but it's not something that's being taught so much as facts. Bottom line is when you have these three compromising theories, the one thing you have to do is alter scripture. And whenever you alter scripture, you can come up with any idea. Now, it doesn't mean it's true. But what you do there is you make God a liar. And the fact of the matter is, if God's going to lie in Genesis 1, then how can we hold him to be true in any other part of scripture? So we have to take God for what he says in Genesis 1, when we study the origins account. Um, about three years ago, I'm going to show a video clip here in um, just a few seconds. About three years ago, these two gentlemen on the screen decided to actually have a debate. The person on the left is Dr. Bill Nye. A lot of you know him. If you're a millennial, you watched him. Uh, Dr. Bill Nye is Bill Nye the science guy, and he created this television show that just promoted science, and I thought it was the coolest thing until I recognized that he actually thinks God is literally just um, a figment of your imagination. Creation is not true. You can't teach creation in any realm, shape, or form. He's a pure atheist and pure evolutionist as well. The person on the right is uh, Dr. Ken Ham. He is the founder of the Creation Museum and the uh, president of Answers in Genesis. And uh, he is a person who would believe in a young earth and believe in the creation account as we see it today. Um, just as a disclaimer, he uses NKJV, so if that's something that destroys his credibility, I want to go ahead and throw that out there. Um, but outside of that, he pretty he holds pretty true to everything that a young earth creationist would believe. These guys had a debate um, about three years ago, and over four or over five million people actually tuned in to this debate and actually watched this evolution versus creation debate. And what happened was you had about an hour of Ken Ham talking and then an hour of Bill Nye talking, and then this lasted about two and a half, almost three hours. And um, what happened is at the end, we had this discussion between the two, and the moderator is the one that's actually asking audience questions. So we're going to watch all two and a half hours of the debate right now. <laughs> totally kidding. I just have two questions that I want us to listen to. It's going to be about six minutes, and then we'll decipher that and close our Sunday School series. Uh, by the way, um, it's going to be really faint to hear because we're using the microphone uh, to let the sound go over the speaker, so for that I apologize for the sound quality. Question, Mr. Nye. Is there room for God in science? Well, we remind us there are billions of people around the world who are religious and who accept science and embrace it, and especially all the technology that it brings us. Is there anyone here who doesn't have a mobile phone that has a camera? Is there anyone here whose family members have not benefited from modern medicine? Is there anyone here who, uh, who doesn't use email? Is there anybody here who doesn't eat? Because we use information sent from satellites in space to plant seeds on our farms. That's how we're able to feed seven one billion people where we used to barely be able to feed a billion. So that's what I see. That's what uh, we have used science in the process. And science for me is two things. It's the body of knowledge, the atomic number of rubidium, and it's the process, the means by which we make these discoveries. So for me, that's not really that connected with your belief in a spiritual being or a higher power. If you uh, reconcile those two. Uh, uh, scientists, the, uh, the head of the National Institutes of Health, is uh, a devout Christian. Uh, there are billions of people in the world who are devoutly religious. Ha they have to be compatible because those same people embrace science. The exception is you, Mr. Ham. That's the problem for me. You want us to take your word for what's written in this ancient text to be more compelling than what we see around us. The evidence for a higher power and spirituality is for me separate. Uh, I encourage you to take the next minute and address this problem of the fossils, this problem of the ice layers, this problem of the ancient trees, this problem of the ark. I mean, really address it. And so then we could move forward. But right now I see no incompatibility between religions and science. Mr. Hamm, response? Yeah, I actually want to take a minute to address the question. Uh, and uh, let me just say this, my answer would be 
God is necessary for science. In fact, you know, you talk about a cell phone. Gee, yeah, I have a cell phone. I love technology. We've got technology here at Anson Genesis. And uh, I, I have email. Probably had millions of them while I've been speaking up here. And uh, satellites, what you said about, you know, the information we get. I, I agree with all that. See, they're the things that, that, that can be done in the present. And that's just like I showed you, Dr. Stuart Burgess, who invented that gear set uh, for uh, the satellite. Creationists can be great scientists, but see, I say God is necessary because you have to assume the laws of logic. You have to assume the laws of nature. You have to assume uh, the, the, the uniformity of nature. And that was the question I had for you. Where does that come from? The universe is here by natural processes. Uh, and, uh, you know, Christianity and science, the Bible and science go hand in hand. We love science. But again, you've got to understand, inventing things, that's very different than talking about our origins. Two very different things. Mr. Hammond, your question. Do you believe the entire Bible is to be taken literally? For example, people who touch pig's skin, I think it says here, be stoned. Can men marry multiple women? Do I believe the entire Bible should be taken literally? Well, remember in my uh, opening address, I said we have to define our terms. So when people are ask that question, say literally, I have to know what that person meant by literally. Now, I would say this, if you say naturally, and that's what you mean by literally, I would say, yes, I take the Bible naturally. What, what do I mean by that? Well, if it's history, as Genesis is, it's written as typical historical narrative, you take it as history. If it's uh, poetry, uh, as we find in the Psalms, then you uh, take it as poetry. It doesn't mean it doesn't teach truth, uh, but it's not a, a cosmological account in the sense that, that Genesis is, there's, there's prophecy in, in the Bible, um, and there's uh, literature in the Bible, you know, concerning future events and so on. So if you take it as written naturally according to the type of literature, and, and you let it speak to you in that way, that's uh, how I take the Bible. It's God's revelation to man. He used different people. The Bible says that all scripture is inspired by God, so God moved people by His Spirit to write His words. And, and also, there's a lot of misunderstanding in regard to Scripture, in regard to the Israelites. I mean, we have laws in our civil government here in America that, that the government says, well, there were certain laws for Israel. And, you know, some people take all that out of context, and then they try to impose it on us today as Christians and say, you should be obeying those laws. It's a misunderstanding of the Old Testament. It's a misunderstanding uh, of, of the New Testament. And, um, you know, again, it's important to take the Bible as a whole, interpreting Scripture as Scripture. It really is the Word of God. Uh, then there's not going to be any contradiction which says not. And by the way, when men were married to multiple women, there were lots of problems. <laughs> and uh, the Bible condemns that for what it is. And the Bible is very clear. Uh, you know, the Bible is a real book. There were people who did things that were not in accord with Scripture. And it records this for us. It helps you understand it's a real book. But marriage was one man to one woman. Jesus reiterated that in Matthew 19, as I had uh, in my talk. And so those that did marry multiple women were, were wrong. Time there, Mr. Not a response. So it sounds to me, just listening to you in the last two minutes, that there are certain parts of this document, or the Bible, that you embrace literally and other parts you consider poetry. So it sounds to me in those last two minutes like you're going to take what you like, uh, interpret literally, and other s passages you're going to you're going to interpret as poetic or descriptions of human events. All that aside. Uh, I'll just say scientifically, or uh, as a reasonable man, it doesn't seem possible that all these things that contradict your literal interpretation of those first few passages, all those things that contradict that, I find unsettling when you want me to embrace the rest of it as literal. Now, I, as I say, am not a theologian, but we started this debate, is the Ken Ham's creation model viable? Does it hold water? Can it fly? Does it describe anything? And I'm still looking for an answer. And time on that. All right, so to wrap up our series, um, those two questions. First question, um, is there any room for God in science? Uh, Dr. Nye says no. There's no connection to it whatsoever. Um, science is provable. It's fact. Ye your religion, if you will, is not provable. You cannot prove God, so it just doesn't connect. Ken Ham says, God is absolutely important, and God is absolutely necessary, is the word he used for science, uh, because he's the creator of science, and science proves what young earth creationists would believe. Um, also, the second question, 
Can't the Bible be taken literally? I wasn't personally too comfortable with Dr. Ham's um, answer. I believe the answer is yes. Um, I understand what he was saying, but what happened was he said you have to take it naturally, so some parts are poetry, you take it poetically, some parts are history, you take it historically. Um, and you know, God has certain laws for Israel in the Old Testament that's different than what we have today. And Bill, Bill and I said, well, okay, well, you're taking some parts poetically, and you're taking some parts figuratively, and some parts naturally and historically. So um, you're expecting me now to say the part that you says that you say, excuse me, is historical, is fact, and I'm supposed to believe that and 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 take that as an answer. Uh, again, it, it's nitpicky for me. I understand what Ken Ham's saying. He's not wrong in that essence. But I just would have worded it better. I do think you could take God's word literally. Um, and if you study scripture, you will know which parts are to be taken poetic and which parts were for um, historic Israel. Did you have a statement on that? Well, the, uh, the statement that he made uh, about all the contradictions or all these, you know, you have to remember, I understand we didn't listen to the entire debate and all the things that he's, quote, listed that are uh, problems for uh, creation, but when you throw out a statement like all the contradictions in the Bible without saying what those contradictions are, you're being very, very dishonest. And when you when you respond to a question like that without saying what contradictions mm -hmm. and deal with the quote contradictions, mm -hmm. that's that's a lot of the issue because mm -hmm. you know if you're if you're an audience member, you've never read the Bible, and somebody says all the contradictions in the Bible. And the other person responds without saying there aren't contradictions in the Bible and prove them to me. Let's go back here. There's no debate. You don't have a premise. You know, it was that was a pathetic debate. In, yeah. Anyway, the, the whole thing was very, very poorly. I, I feel like, given two weeks of time, I could have done a better job than Ken Ham, who's an expert in the field, uh, actually in the debate, simply from a different approach of the scripture. And that is, I think, one of the best summaries is look at when you use a, a New King James Bible, which you believe. Uh, it has a superior text. Look at where you go. Look at the slippery slope you're on when you believe that the Word of God has has error in it. And so you're using this text, and then you have to figure out uh, some... It's interesting because I'm actually preaching about the poetic thing as part of the message today. So, um, but... Yeah, I, I, I definitely 100% uh, would agree. I, I thought, um, like I said, just with that particular answer, that it was a little bit on the um, on the weaker side, but the point that I'm trying to get at is in studying origins and in studying our entire uh, series the past four weeks. What we have to recognize that the evolutionist's greatest need is not to figure out whether the Earth was made 6,000 years ago or 13.8. The evolutionist's greatest need is not to figure out where did singularity come from. Rather, the evolutionist's greatest need is Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, the fact of the matter is. They don't believe the Bible because they don't think that the Bible is true. And if they don't think the Bible is true, they don't believe in their need for Jesus Christ. And we as Christians ought to be able to pray, and we ought to be able to witness to people who don't believe in the origins account. Because see, the origins account is actually very foundational. The origins account introduces sin. The origins account actually introduces uh, the gospel. And it answers a lot of these common questions that you and I have. The fact of the matter is, when we study the origins account, we become better at understanding where we came from, we understand how God created us, and we understand our need for a savior, and that's what an evolutionist needs. They need to realize their need for a savior, and they need Jesus Christ as their savior. Everything else will fall into play. Everything else, whether God created the world, how long that is, everything else they'll understand just through studying the scripture. But instead of studying the hours or four weeks to try to debate them, show them to Christ, and then with that, you'll be able to um, win over an evolutionist from there. That's all the time that I have. Is there any questions, 60 seconds for any questions that anyone has? Okay, you guys have been wonderful. Sorry to bore you to death for the past month. Uh, next week, Charlie will bore you even more. Um, so, <laughs> let's... Let's pray, and we'll end our Sunday school. Father, thank you so much for what you've taught us uh, this past month, and thank you so much for the opportunity I had uh, just to teach what you have put in your word. God, I just pray we'll be able to apply it. 
and be able to use the door in our lives. We pray this in your name. Amen.